Hello and welcome back to part three of a 10-part series. GNI TV and other community access stations in the Vermont Access Network are hosting in partnership with the Vermont Council on Rural Development and the Barry Times Argus and Rutland Herald newspapers. I'm Andrew McKeever, the news director of GNI TV's news project, and it's a pleasure to have you with us today. This 10-part series about ideas for the future of Vermont uh, looks at what are some of the big questions that are facing the state as we emerge out of the pandemic and, uh, and into whatever lies ahead. What are some of the critical elements we'll need to build into the next chapter in Vermont's history? Upcoming topics we'll be talking about will include such areas as education, childcare, business development, civic engagement, and several others. So far, we've talked about broadband development and welcoming new Vermonters, and today, our topic is climate change and the state's economy. The third proposition we'll be discussing today is Vermont must advance creative economic solutions to climate change. To help us unpack this proposition, uh, we have a very distinguished panel with us, uh, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves uh, to you right now before we uh, take our deep dive into, uh, into climate change. And, uh, I'll look to my friend John Copans of the Vermont Council on Rural Development to uh, get us started. Ah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, I'm John Copans. I'm a staff member at the Council on Rural Development and really looking forward to this conversation today. Carol? Hello. Yes, my name is Carol Weston, and I am the Director of Efficiency Vermont, the state's energy efficiency utility, and I'm also really looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you for having me. And I'm Joe Fusco. I'm a vice president of Casella Way Systems down here in Rutland. Uh, I currently chair the Vermont Climate Economy Action Team, which is facilitated by the Vermont Council on Rural Development. And I'm also a teacher and advisor in the Sustainable Innovation MBA program at the University of Vermont. All right. Well, welcome to all. Uh, great to have you with us today. This is, uh, I'm sure, going to be a, a really interesting conversation uh, coming up. But before we uh, before we get into uh, into the proposition itself, uh, John, I wondered if you could just sort of uh, frame up the propositions and give us a bit of a background to the project and how it all came about. You bet. Uh, thank you, Andrew. And you know what's interesting about this Vermont proposition effort is our thinking about it actually started before the pandemic, believe it or not. And in a way, um, the impetus uh, and the motivation to do it has only increased given sort of the up upheaval and disruption that the pandemic has brought. But in fact, 10 years ago, we hosted a massive statewide conversation called the Council on the Future of Vermont. And the sense amongst our board at VCRD was it was time to go back to Vermonters and essentially ask the question, what can we be doing as a state over the next three years to really tee up our success and a vibrant state for the next 30 years? And from that has emerged these 10 propositions. And, you know, our first level of engagement in this work has been a tremendous number of interviews with Vermonters where we really help draft and flesh out this this set of 10 draft propositions. We also have a survey that well over a thousand Vermonters have filled out giving feedback on this. And I, I really wanna emphasize that when we're talking about these 10 propositions, we're really still in draft form. We are engaging Vermonters and welcoming feedback and suggestions. What did we miss? What did we get wrong as we have this conversation? And so in a way today is about sort of bringing the issue forward, talking about the proposition number three around the climate economy, but also really trying to give uh, the audience something to engage with and react to as well. Uh, I, and I guess the other thing I wanna do is just quickly uh, describe proposition number three for folks. You know, uh, Andrew uh, said it, Vermont must advance creative economic solutions to climate change. And what, what we know is that climate change is an existential threat. Uh, the change in our climate uh, means upheaval. It means changes in weather. It means changes in ecosystems that are gonna prove tremendously challenging over the coming decades. And so that is serious. But what we also know is that uh, both Vermonters, Americans, globally, we are responding to this threat. We are marshalling capital and people to respond 
and to adapt and really try to minimize our contributions to climate change. And so in that response, Vermont has some opportunity. Vermont businesses and Vermonters have some opportunity to figure out how can we play a part in that global response and capture some of that, frankly, global deployment of capital and really uh, almost uh, think of it as an economic development tool in Vermont, while of course continuing to take very seriously the threat. So that's a lot of what this proposition is about, is how does Vermont frame that up? What are the things that we can do as a state to really go right at that question? So thanks, Andrew. All right. Well, uh, just to kind of get us started here as we begin, um, I guess I thought I'd ask uh, what I'm sure for, for many folks will seem like a very self-evident and almost uh, unnecessary question, um, but why is worrying about climate change important here uh, in Vermont? I mean, uh, we're a small state. Um, I mean, whatever we might be doing in the way of driving electric, electric cars or e-vehicles or recycling or composting or any of these other activities that... Uh, you know, would be helpful uh, in terms of climate change would be offset probably uh, someplace else in the world. Um, so I just wondered, you know, uh, given our size and everything, what makes our contribution to this important? And and Joe, perhaps I'll ask you to kind of start that. You wrote a, a really interesting op-ed that appeared in the Times Argus and the Rutland Herald that uh, uh, addressed uh, this to some degree. And I thought you'd be a great person to get us started on that one. Thanks, Andrew. I there's really two answers. The first answer is you can either curse the darkness or light a candle. So what can Vermont do? Well, we can light a candle. And we can, you know, all we need is a million other candles to be lit too, but our responsibility is just to light our candle. The other way to approach that question is, is I would kind of reject the word that we should worry about it. I don't think it's necessarily something to worry about. I think it's something to embrace, something to lean into. Uh, and look at it as a wonderful opportunity to con not only contribute to the solution of the problem, but find out how we can benefit and create value for ourselves, value for our communities by solving a very important problem for humanity and see it as an economic development problem or a place or making Vermont a place where uh, the, those solutions come from and therefore become a very strong economy. And Carol, what is your thought? Absolutely. That's a great answer, Joe. And, you know, I, I completely agree. And, and I might add that, you know, Vermont has a long history of being a leader uh, when it comes to lots of things. And um, certainly our economy centers around tourism and agriculture and things that the natural environment is really a big part of. And so it is in our best interest to take that opportunity, to seize that opportunity and, and really march ahead with innovative solutions that, you know, you can try things in a small state that you can't often do in, in larger areas. And that's another thing that Vermont has going for it. It's the ability to, to try new things and innovate and, and really show, show the rest of the nation, you know, what can be done. What do you think are the sort of the, uh, the advantages or the things that Vermont businesses have to gain from taking on climate change? Are there, there are some opportunities here for uh, business growth and development, uh, breaking into some new areas and, um, what might some of those be? I, I wondered if any of you could give a, an example or two of that. Yeah, so the first opportunity is really around business creation, businesses that don't even exist yet. That's the first category to think about. So somewhere in the world today or somewhere in the world in the next few years, somebody is going to invent different ways to create and distribute and use clean energy. Somebody's going to be inventing ways to change the way we heat our homes and businesses. Somebody's going to invent the way we change the way we transport ourselves, the way we move to and from work and home into the store and the way we move our goods and services across our highways. Right. So all of these problems are going to be solved. I think our proposition here is why shouldn't that happen in Vermont? Why can't Vermont be a spectacularly attractive place to start a business that solves those problems? We have that ethic. I think we have that drive that's somehow in our culture. Can we be disruptive enough during disruptive times? Can we be disruptive enough in the way we think about public policy to create an economy and create a series of incentives that draw the best minds in the world to Vermont 
to be domicile here to solve these problems. So that's the first way to look at it. What businesses can be created solving this problem, and why shouldn't they live here? And then the second part, which is probably more in Carol's uh, bailiwick, is how do existing businesses become more efficient being driven by the imperatives of climate change and the way we use energy and the way we use the limited resources, how can they become more efficient to become economically stronger and more efficient themselves as businesses? All right, Carol, do uh, you want to comment on that? Yes, I definitely do. You know, so I, I'm in the energy efficiency business, and I'm proud to say that over the past 20 years, Vermonters have made a huge investment in efficiency, and it has paid dividends to the tune of over $2 billion in savings that would have been spent on energy that Vermont can invest in different ways. Those are both businesses and homeowners and renters. And so thinking about a business making a change to their their operation or their uh, their client, their carbon footprint, that gives them an opportunity to save money on what they're spending on energy and, and reinvest that into their business and grow their products, build new product lines. And we've seen that happen time and time again. And the other thing I'd say is that, you know, Vermont currently has over 10,000 efficient or energy jobs in the state. So there are 10,000 people working on energy and throughout the state already. And there's an opportunity to grow that and think about new jobs in Vermont that might help uh, both reduce our carbon footprint, save our climate, and really bring Vermont forward into this new energy transition. And, and it's a really exciting thing, I think, both for businesses and also for, um, you know, contractors and, and the like to get involved in. That's a great summary, I think. And it's probably part of the reason why I don't worry about climate change, the way I said so earlier, is really, if you look at it, and if you're an optimist, this, what is being handed to us on one level is the single biz biggest business development and economic development opportunity in a generation, right? Businesses, people, we get paid to solve problems. Here is a really interesting problem, a very significant problem that's going to pay great dividends to people who can solve these problems of energy and transportation and limited resources and climate. So it's, it's an exciting time as well as, and I understand this sometimes, a scary time, but it's also ultimately we have to approach this from great optimism. You know, I can think of a specific example of what both Joe and Carol are talking about. A, a few years ago, I joined Efficiency Vermont, hosted an event at GE in Rutland, where they make aircraft engines. And, and they were working on this challenge on both sides of it. One is they use a lot of electricity because they're a big manufacturing facility employing hundreds of Vermonters. And they were working in collaboration with Efficiency Vermont to really bring down their uh, electricity costs and really refining that and really pushing the envelope to save energy. So that allows them to produce more of what they produce at lower cost, which makes them globally competitive. But the other thing that was neat about that visit is they're manufacturing components that are going into airline engines. And like you think about how much fuel is used uh, to fly airplanes around and these little but really technologically advanced uh, improvements to the propellers have significant efficiency gains for, for those engines. And so they're working on both sides of it, both reducing their own energy use, but producing a product that's helping uh, airlines uh, reduce their energy use as well. So, and, and when we think about it, their success in the climate economy is creating real jobs for Vermonters on the ground in Rutland. And I think protecting those jobs as well. Those jobs are stronger because of what GE is doing. Absolutely right. So many stories like that, including Casella being um, uh, in a large employer in Vermont that's made large, you know, energy investments in its own, own operation to save, you know, and, and be willing to do more things and sort of be able to grow their business. And we see that day in and day out in Vermont across, across all counties. What do you all see as the biggest obstacles to all of this moving forward? Um, you know, I, there's general consensus around the fact that this is, uh, these are the jobs of the future, uh, business opportunities of the future. It seems to be fairly, uh, fairly settled, but uh, I guess I find myself wondering, okay, um, should the pace of this all be faster? Or is there something that the state government could be doing to help accelerate that along? And I guess wondered if you, and if you had any thoughts about, you know, 
if I were if I were in the government, why we'd be doing this, you know, to to, to uh, sort of and allow companies to kind of move forward faster on that agenda. You know, John mentioned that this is also happening during a pandemic, and I think from a business person's perspective, one of the again optimistic things that's coming out of this pandemic is you have an amazing opportunity to break things. Right. Change your business models, change the way you think, change the way you invent processes and systems. And so we have to ask collectively, do we have the intestinal fortitude at a public policy level to break the way we used to do economic development and think about it in a different, perhaps more innovative way that is more um, relevant to the challenges of the future than what we were trying to achieve in the past. So changing Vermont's economy is not a small thing. It takes a public policy wave, if you will, to say, let's think differently about this problem. Let's find new ways to attract capital. That means both financial capital, but intellectual capital, right? And treat it well, right? Give it a place where it can feel warm and safe and can take root in the ground. And maybe we'll get a different outcome from an economic development standpoint than we have in the past. There is a precedence for this, of course. We have decided uh, several years ago or decades ago that we really wanted to be the home of the captive insurance company. We create a whole bunch of public policy incentives that would attract those businesses to be here in Vermont. Very similarly, I think we have to think that way when we're talking about what kind of energy innovation businesses, transportation innovation businesses, construction, the way we build our houses, the way we build office buildings. How do we attract them here so that this is the best place for them to plant their intellectual capital, their human capital, and their financial capital? You know, uh, just dovetailing off of that, and then I think an, a great example of that is the creation of Efficiency Vermont. You know, um, I think a little more than 20 years ago, our regulators convened a conversation around energy efficiency and made the decision that we should do this across our utilities in a collective way. We should make an investment in energy efficiency because Vermonters stand to gain so much in terms of savings on their electric bill. And so they facilitated a whole process. And from that process emerged Efficiency Vermont as an entity. And Efficiency Vermont, what's neat about Efficiency Vermont is it lives within the Vermont Energy Investment Corp. And in fact, you look at those great jobs that we have uh, at Efficiency Vermont, those have, I would say, blossomed into other jobs serving other states around the country doing energy efficiency work because Vermont was a test bed and is still a test bed pushing the envelope of how can we be as aggressive as possible with our electrical efficiency. And, um, and that, so I think that's a piece of the story as well is some smart regulatory sort of intervention to help prompt and create an environment for the innovation uh, that we need. Yeah, thank you. thank you for that, John. And, you know, Efficiency Vermont has been working in the efficiency space, as you said, for a couple of decades now making really great strides in reducing our electric use. And now we know, you know, that um, along with electric uh, use decrease comes a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions, but greenhouse gas emissions are also coming from our transportation and our heating sector. And so Efficiency Vermont with its regulators and its partners has really been working to evolve its work as well, moving into areas like refrigeration management, where we're working with, you know, technologies that have refrigerant in them, which have a quite a high global warming potential and provide an opportunity for contractors and distributors and companies to move into Vermont and think about what are the technology solutions that can reduce refrigerant leaks across Vermont, reduce greenhouse gases that come from refrigerant leaks, and how can we transfer that knowledge outside of Vermont after that? So really, like you say, it's that test bed. So as the energy efficiency utility evolves into thinking about greenhouse gas reductions and transportation changes and, and how we support the electric vehicle supply chain and get uh, customers aware of electric vehicles, there's an opportunity there to really change how some of our existing businesses even are doing business. And and, and also, I, I think also attracting young people to stay in Vermont and or move to Vermont when they see 
hey, there are jobs there that are stable, that that pay well, that that give me work that feels rewarding. It makes people want to come here and, and live here. And that's also really important as well. Yeah, well, just a, oh, sorry, Andrew, one well, more well, point on that, which, you know, Joe mentioned that intellectual capital in, in addition to financial capital. If you if you want to talk about obstacles, I think continuing to attract a workforce that can do this work around um, around the climate economy is really an important piece of the puzzle. When we think about massive investments in weatherization in Vermont homes, one of the one of the hurdles we have to get over is the workforce that can do that, the, the capacity. And similarly, for so many Vermont sort of employers and manufacturers, attracting and retaining really great people to work in this field. And, and how are we growing that right here in Vermont? What does our training system look like such that we're really, we have a constant uh, source of great uh, people who want to work in these fields? Great. And I'll just add one more thing. Sorry, Andrew, but, you know, as we think about, you know, broadband and the focus on expanding broadband, that also ties into that workforce development piece of of having people be able to live in different places all over Vermont and still be able to participate in the climate economy in different ways. So everything starts to tie together once you really dive into it. I was wondering, um, before we pivot on to a few other points in this, uh, we're at a moment, uh, as you all know, where uh, all of a sudden uh, the financing for some of these sorts of ideas has become a, less of a, an object uh, or a problem than it might have been, let's say, even five or six months ago. Uh, there's going to be uh, a gusher of federal money coming to the state through the uh, uh, ARPA, American Rescue Plan Act. Um, and about 200 million of that, uh, the governor would like to set aside for climate change initiatives. Uh, 25 million for low income home weatherization, uh, 25 million for electrical, electric vehicle in infrastructure, and uh, about 100 million to, uh, to fund a forthcoming uh, climate action plan. I guess I'm just wondering if you were uh, able to whisper in the ear of the governor and say, uh, well, that sounds great, but you could do this. Would there be something that uh, would be part of that conversation? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think that... Still keep gonna, a job afterwards? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think there's going to be no limit to the amount of fun people are going to have spending that money in, in various places. But I just want to take a little bit of a contrarian view, and it's not that money alone that is going to build the climate economy in Vermont. It's going to take some things that are free which is a different public policy structure that treats these kinds of businesses advantageously, right? So it's passing laws, it's changing our tax structure, it's changing our permitting structure, so that these businesses are attracted to this particular Petri dish, right? So it's about creating a Petri dish where these businesses can thrive, you know, in, in, in an environment that's friendly to these businesses. Nothing against the government spending that money to, to prime the pump and spur various activities, but I want to suggest it's about a change in the way we think about economic development and the resulting public policy that is the real opportunity here. You know, one thing that caught my eye from the governor's proposal is that significant portion of the money dedicated to climate change. He sort of set aside and said, you know what, it's really up to the Climate Commission to make some development decisions and and make a plan around that. And on one hand, I'm a little bit like, oh, I feel some urgency and I want some specificity. And, and that sort of, we, we wonder, okay, well, what does that mean? But the flip side of that is, you know what, it is really important to have a deep public conversation about where these opportunities are and to really give Vermonters an opportunity to weigh in on this. I think sometimes we see these decisions get made by a select few, and I, I know the Climate Commission is taking this very seriously, the public engagement piece, and making sure some of those Vermonters who haven't traditionally been around the table really have the opportunity to weigh in, because honestly, sometimes they are the ones who stand uh, to benefit. And, and you know, kudos to Efficiency Vermont. They've really helped us understand this thing called an energy burden. There's some Vermonters who really, when you look at their total energy cost as a proportion of their income, it's, it's huge. 
And, and that impact to that household of those electric bills and those fuel bills can really overwhelm their household budgets. And so if you think about the Vermonters who really stand to benefit from some of these energy saving and money saving opportunities, it's it's some of those folks. And, and so some sort of taking a deep breath and being sure we are talking to and engaging the Vermonters who really need to be part of that conversation as we develop some of these solutions, I think is, is admirable. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, John. You know, we know that energy burden ranges, you know, anywhere from 6 to 20% across towns in the state. And that means that a family might be paying up to 20% of their income towards the cost of energy. And we really want to reduce that, you know, and, and thinking about a family living in a small town in Vermont, reducing their energy burden from 20 to 10%, that's a big change for them. And that's money that they can reinvest uh, to help them move forward into the local economy and, and for their family and education. And so, you know, really thinking, you know, and, and I really do appreciate Joe's point, like this one-time investment and this infusion of funds, is going to be great to kickstart things. And then as we settle in to the kind of the rest of time and what that looks like, I think my, my advice is to consider, you know, that um, low and moderate income Vermonters are more burdened than others as it relates to paying for energy. And that um, we really want to make sure that the solutions that we come up with to, to fund our climate initiatives are not disproportionately burdening them, burdening them or, or leaving them behind. But we also know that climate change goals bring a huge upside in terms of creating thousands of jobs and building resilience and create, you know, building community and strengthening the economy. So there's so much opportunity here that I, I'm really just glad there's a lot happening. And, and I just want to make sure we seize those opportunities to bring everyone along in this energy transition. Do you, do you feel that there's a lack of consensus around the entire state, though, on that point of uh, adapting uh, new energy technologies and taking advantage of uh, some of these uh, I mean, I guess I'm, I find myself thinking, um, well, if, 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 if it was that, if the advantages were so obviously clear to everyone across the board, all income groups, were all geographical groups, does it seem to you, though, that the pace of all this could be faster? I mean, if that were the case, I mean, clearly there must be some people who say, well, yeah, that all sounds great, but what if that means the cost of uh, filling my car up with gasoline becomes more expensive? Or there's some other tax that has to go to finance this. I mean, do you think that we've got to, got to a point where there's enough agreement that uh, both in the short term and the long term, uh, some of these changes will be, be good for everybody, both on the individual and family levels, as well as broader community levels? One thing that I observe is just the power of sort of word of mouth in communities as we adopt some of these new technologies. I, um, our family bought our first fully electric vehicle a couple of years ago. We got it secondhand. And like, I tell you, anyone who will listen, I will sort of talk their ear off about the fact that that car is never going to go to a gas station. And just like the convenience of just plugging in it at home, there's like, a, there's, there are aspects to these transitions that you sort of don't really appreciate until you go through it. And then you talk to other people about it. And, and to some degree, I feel like we are on a curve similar with cold climate heat pumps, where when you talk to some people about like the dehumidifier, the dehumidifying that you get in your basement from a from a heat pump hot water heater or the fact that instead of having that ugly and noisy window air conditioner that you throw in every year all of a sudden you've got a unit that is really efficient and quiet that provides a little bit of cooling in addition to heating uh it's uh, what i see is vermonters sort of being evangelists for one another in a way that i feel like really helps push us along on the curve. That's not all of the puzzle by any scope, but I do see some real power in that in that kind of action. Yeah, I mean there's there's a lot that goes into changing people's behavior and changing the things that they're used to using. So, you know, there's certainly comfort in knowing how your gasoline vehicle runs and how you're going to maintain it. And so, you know, it's it's definitely um, important to 
let people know how electric vehicles work. And so the education component of these newer technologies is really important to get out there. And one thing that Efficiency Vermont really does focus on is, is how to talk to people about those things and make information available to them. Because as John said, there's an adoption curve with any technology, whether it's an iPhone or an electric vehicle or a heat pump in your home. There's always going to be early adopters and there will always be those that sort of lag and wait until the end. And what we want to do is accelerate that accelerate that transition through the adoption curve by having money available to help people make choices, giving them you know, the education and information they need, setting up those policies and systems that Joe is talking about to make the economy grow and be able to support the transition. So it just begins to have this whole sort of change management piece to it. And as more people adopt it, more people talk about it, and then it becomes, you know, sort of gains its own momentum. I think it's, I think it's okay to have disagreement and debate. I think that is a natural, organic stage for this change, and it's where we are right now. So it's really not a terrible thing. It's just something to acknowledge and accept. I think leaders have an obligation, whether it be public policy leaders or business leaders, to do a lot of talking about bringing the future into the present. So you have to explain to people two things, the negative consequences of doing nothing so they can feel that now, and also the positive outcomes of doing something very interesting and innovative. So we have to do a lot more talking and a lot more discussing and a lot more debating. I also think we have to acknowledge the pain that it may cause changing. And to Carol's early earlier part, we have to acknowledge that some people are going to, it's going to be rougher waters, especially lower and middle income people to make this change. So you got to acknowledge that pain. You have to acknowledge the fear, right? And, and so I think, you know, still having that conversation and doing that work of leading people through this discussion is, is going, to be, going to be very crucial. I think we need to give ourselves permission that it's not going to be a perfect process, but it's something we do have to start. We do have to acknowledge and move forward on. And one of, one of the other great things that comes along with making, um, you know, energy changes in your home or business is that the benefits go beyond those energy savings. And, and so having people understand that weatherizing their home can give them, you know, not only a, a lower fuel bill, but more comfort, a healthier home, the benefits, you know, are bigger than just greenhouse gas emissions. And that's saying a lot because greenhouse gas emissions are really a large part of it all. And so, um, you know, helping folks to understand what all those benefits are really will, I think, help spur some of that discussion Joe's talking about. Before we leave the subject of e-vehicles, uh, I, 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 want, I wanted to ask, uh, how, how do you feel uh, that's all going? I mean, uh, that's uh, in, in the, when the state adopted its uh, energy goals for 2030 and 2050, it was pointed out frequently that uh, you know, the importation of oil and fossil fuels into the state was a big part of uh, our overall energy uh, profile. And uh, electric vehicles were, I think, mentioned frequently as, as a great way to kind of reduce that, uh, that uh, carbon emission uh, level. Um, do you think we're making progress as quickly as we could be on, on, e on adapting e-vehicles? And, and what do you think see as the main obstacle? Uh, the first big obstacle that comes to mind to me is the lack of char charging stations, stations around the state. I mean, I I don't own an e vehicle yet, although it's certainly been one thing I've been thinking about. But whenever I think if I wanted to take a drive to the other end of the state, I'm going, huh? If I'm if I'm in Newport, is there going to be a charging station where I can refill my car? Um, is that an area that should be a, a more of a priority? Do you think uh, for the state and folks to get? To conquer that range anxiety? You know, I'll make one point, which is actually Vermont's a leader in terms of EV charging infrastructure. We actually have more sort of per capita, a higher density of chargers than pretty much anywhere else in the country. So, and it's been a priority of the governor to do that. They're not always so visible. So I think, and, and in a way they're not visible until you own an EV and all of a sudden you get really tuned in a little bit to where they are. Um, but the other thing that I have found as an EV owner is like, I, it is so rare that I'm charging my car somewhere other than at my home. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you know that until you adopt the technology and realize that, you know what, there are very few chip trips, uh, depending on the range of your vehicle, where you're going to need to charge at your destination in order to get home or something like that uh, as well. So, uh, you know, a final point is like the diversity of electric vehicles that are coming on the market is just 
uh, pretty exciting. Like I just saw Senator Perch like take delivery. He shared on Facebook, he took delivery of his new Ford Mustang, fully electric. And man, like, you know, my kids talk about the Cybertruck versus the Rivian and which one they want because they really <laughs> want a fully electric pickup truck. And so like, you know, what's funny about a vehicle, if we're honest about it, is it's a representation of ourselves. You know, it's like one of those things. It's almost like a, it's, it is who we are as our vehicle. And so I feel like more vehicles are coming online where different people across sort of the spectrum of Vermonters are going to be pretty excited about sort of what they represent in addition to sort of what, what they do from a function standpoint. More, um, more specifically, here's how you can feel the economy is coming. So there's a regional gas station and convenience store chain that has a, a locations in Vermont, and they partnered with Green Mountain Power to put 10 Tesla charging stations in their parking lot. So you know when a business, which is run by a profit motive, feels that this is something they should invest in because they want people to come in and spend money, and they're on a particular corner on a way to a particular resort here in central and southern Vermont, where they're going to attract people who are going to leave New Jersey in their Teslas and in their electric vehicles to come here. You know something's changing when a convenience store chain says, we need to do this and we're going to spend the money. And the irony is, is that the electric charging stations outnumber the gas pumps at this particular gas station. So you can feel it. It's real. Somebody has right. made a choice, an economic choice, based on incentives or stimuli or whatever, to say, we, this is the way of the future. So it'll get here. Absolutely. And, and like John said, the technology is changing. New, new vehicles and manufacturers are coming out with electric fleets every single day. And, you know, seeing um, the opportunity for there to be all-wheel drive electric vehicles or electric trucks, I mean, that starts to bring um, all of the needs of Vermonters into focus and thinking about what their electric vehicle needs to be for them and, and how they're going to move through the transition. So, you know, we Again, I'll throw another stat out there. We spend 40% of our energy money on transportation. There is a huge opportunity here. And one other thing I'll add is that, you know, the ability of Vermonters to find used electric vehicles is also really important. And so working, um, you know, working with uh, car dealerships, whether they're new or pre-owned car dealerships, to, you know, understand the electric vehicle fleet in Vermont and how we can keep electric vehicles here when they're used and sell them here is also going to be a really big factor in making that accessibility open to all Vermonters to get that electric vehicle. Andrew, I don't know if, can I just add one other piece, which is there was a pretty Absolutely. cool new news piece yesterday when we're talking about electric transportation, which is there is an outfit out of Burlington called Beta Technologies. They are pioneering electric flight. They're literally a leader internationally in electric flight, and they just signed a deal yesterday with UPS, right? So you think about like UPS with all of those brown trucks driving all over, delivering packages, they are thinking towards the future and Kyle Clark and the team at Beta up in Burlington are now hiring more people in Vermont to develop this new electric flight technology. And so like, that's like the tangible example that that future is coming at us and Vermont is, is, is right in the mix in doing something that literally is totally cutting edge uh, in the globe. It's, it's really neat to, to see those examples. I wanted to return to a point, uh, one of you mentioned earlier, well, you probably all mentioned it earlier, and that's that whole business around uh, workforce development and job training for these types of new jobs that will be coming uh, a part of the new green energy economy as it evolves. Uh, how are we doing in that, in that regard? I mean, uh, when I look at what seems to be the case nationally, it seems that uh, there's, there's just a, a, as a whole, as a country, we're having a lot of trouble uh, either retraining or upskilling people into these, into these jobs that would be part of, uh, uh, you know, the green economy. Um, here in Vermont, what, what are some of the uh, issues you're seeing? Are, are, are there not enough uh, young, young folks uh, 
interested in, in that type of work and those types of jobs? Is it a supply question or is it a matter of fine tuning the educational structure in some way to kind of uh, build a pipeline uh, to, uh, to kind of, you know, bring more people into it? You know, I think it's probably a combination. Uh, I'll start there <laughs> and certainly say, you know, in terms of uh, businesses that are existing in Vermont today, you know, suppliers, contractors, uh, engineering firms, you know, they have been evolving as technology comes out to learn how to install and stock in Vermont and get these uh, pieces of equipment um, to businesses and homeowners, you know, for years now. We've been working, we work with over 400 businesses in our um, Efficiency Excellence Network, which is our group of efficiency contractors. And and that doesn't include, you know, the solar network of contractors and, and, and many other and so I, I think there are a lot of businesses that understand and want to be involved in it. Certainly, um, one of the things we see that happens sometimes is that the uh, geo equity kind of across the state is uneven. So there may be more, more contractors or service providers in one area than another. And so we want to make sure that we're providing an opportunity for businesses to grow into new parts of the state, whether it's the Northeast Kingdom or somewhere in Southern Vermont where there aren't as many contractors, say in weatherization, for example. And then we also want to make sure we're providing training um, to, to those contractors that want to build their workforce with new, new people. And so offering those those training opportunities for the existing businesses, and then reaching into the partnerships with the, the technical schools, the vocational centers, and thinking about a curriculum that might include, uh, you know, a green uh, a green economy curriculum, you know, where there are ways for people to learn um, trades and professions that are a part of this this clean economy and seeing a future in them. So I think it's it's all of the above. It's 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 expanding our current workforce. It's it's training more people, and it's also thinking about how we create that pipeline of workers coming forward and letting them know there's there is work in this area and it's important work. To kind of build on that a little bit, uh, in the wind and solar sectors, are, are we seeing enough uh, growth in? Uh, energy potential there. Uh, I mean, those projects have been very controversial in the past around the state. Uh, do you think that uh, the way forward for getting kind of green energy sources like that is is uh, is broadening somewhat or, or, or are, they, are those kinds of projects still struggling to kind of get off the ground because, you know, it's in the wrong place in somebody's opinion? You know, there was an interesting story in seven days a week or two ago about our grid and modernization of our, in particular, our transmission grid, because there are some places in Vermont where we actually have an excess of energy and not enough electric load to use that energy, and it's just a constrained region. And so I know that's one area. I mean, that was an interesting story because what we had in that story was a dairy farmer trying to figure out, or maybe it was a cheesemaker, I'm forgetting what it was, but they wanted to install a digester that would generate some electricity. But the obstacle for them was that there was no room in the grid for them to inter interconnect to that grid. And it felt like, well, that's really too bad. We've got someone employing great folks up in Franklin County and an, an opportunity for them to invest in the future. And so I know that's one area that people are really uh, thinking more deeply about is how do we upgrade that grid such that we can really integrate these renewables in a in a in a smarter way? And just actually to mention another Vermont, I'm I'm sort of mentioning a lot of Vermont companies. There's a pretty neat one that started in Vermont, actually at UVM, called Packetized Energy. And like one of the ways you think about the electric grid now is that it's more of a dance around the production. It used to be you just had big producers of electricity going into a transmission grid, to a distribution grid, and to people's homes, and to, to businesses and whatnot. But now things are becoming much smarter where the electric users can actually sort of adjust their electric use for times when there's not enough electricity or times when there's an, an excess of electricity. And packetized energy out of Burlington is sort of in that in-between space of trying to orchestrate a bunch of different individual homes electric load such that they can deliver sort of services to the electric grid. And so that's just like one more example of like 
how quickly our relationship to these things like electricity, you know, most of us, we just flip a switch, the electricity comes on and that's the end of it. But the truth is our relationship to our utility and to the grid is going through this revolution. And, uh, and Vermont companies are sort of in the middle of that, trying to develop the technologies of the future. So if you think about the problem as a system, fossil fuels have one significant advantage over solar and wind, that until that advantage is destroyed or disrupted by solar or wind, you won't have the growth that you're looking for. And that advantage is storage. I can put hundreds of thousands of gallons of heating oil in a tank at a at a harbor, at a railroad yard. I can put natural gas there. I can put heating oil. I can put automobile gas, right? That energy can be stored. And so what John's talking about is how are we doing this dance about having access when we need it? And so I think the big, I'll lay this down as the big innovation challenge for any business development person that wants to be insanely rich is solve the storage problem of electrons. Once, once we can store electrons in our basements, in our, in our cars, in our, in our workplaces, then the rationale for fossil fuels in many ways goes away. And now I can harvest free electrons from the sky and keep it somewhere until I need it. And that will be the most incredible economic launch pad for solar and wind that I think we've seen in a long time. So. Put our, let's put our best minds and attract the best businesses possible to Vermont to solve the storage problem, the battery problem. I thought Elon great, Musk had already done that with the power wall. <laughs> that, that's, well, that's getting there. That's certainly getting, getting there. there I think. Yeah. Yeah. But talk I'll about add, a scale. At scale, can you store electrons? Yeah, I'd like to add one more thing to the that exciting those exciting changes, and that's the idea of flexible load management or managing our use of, of electricity and electrons and, and how we manage that through technology. And, um, you know, as Joe said, storage is very important, but we can also shift our peak and shift our load because now technologies are available that tell our heat pump hot water heater when to turn on or, uh, you know, when to turn off. And so as we have more of that sort of smart technology, we can begin on a, with small changes that are multiplied over thousands of users to shift our load from its peak, which is currently happening kind of after the sun goes down and we have that less, you know, less solar online back into the time where we've got a lot of solar that's being produced, we can try to use that up. So it's that combination of we're able to store it, but we're also able to use it differently at different times and control it through our technologies. And that's also really exciting work. So I'm, I'm standing here listening to John and Carol talk about all these exciting things and innovations, and I'm tingling. And it just brings me back to the original proposition, which is why aren't we making it easy to run these businesses, to start these businesses here in Vermont? We should become the Silicon Valley of this approach to the future, right? So let's attract people, capital, ideas, so that What's happening in Vermont is that Vermonters are inventing the future for the rest of the world. I just want to say on that point, uh, part of it is building our brand and our reputation. To some degree, we're already doing it, and we really need to brag and elevate it and let people know about it, because Vermont really is a pioneer in a lot of this. There's more to do. There's more businesses to attract and grow, but some of it is how do we shine that spotlight whether that's our elected leaders or others, to really build that brand as a place uh, to come grow these climate economy businesses. I was going to say, Joe, you anticipated my next question, which was, how do we do that? You know, uh, I mean, how do we, um, I keep on going back to the example of Jake Burton and the snowboard, you know, which was uh, created not too far away from here in Londonderry. Um, you know, that's an example of like a homegrown kind of thing that, uh, you know, really became identified with Vermont and was just, a, you know, grew uh, a whole new industry. How, how do we make that happen uh, in Vermont like that? Is that going to come from like individual folks working in their basements or garages or or is it going to come from companies that are already here and, and involved in it, do you think? Probably a little of both. I mean, we need a lot more of people like Paul Hines and, and Packetized Energy to say, I want to make this my life's work. He happens to be here. It's great. And we, 
we should become an attractive place to come and live. Now with the pandemic, one thing we've learned is you don't have to live anywhere to work anywhere. So why part of the re, part of the challenge would be to get people to come here because they can be here and yet do global work in inventing and global work in connecting with other people. You've described a very complex system that a lot of things and a lot of moving parts have to happen. Part of it is public policy. Part of it is, you know, just the the happy meeting of gasoline, uh, tinder, and, and a match, right, for certain things to happen. But I think from a, the things that we can control right now is to create a public policy that creates a special kind of Petri dish for certain kinds of businesses to thrive here. And let's not forget having institutions like University of Vermont right. and a sustainable MBA program. I mean, think about Definitely. having students who are sort of there, but also in the community doing this work as well. I mean, there's significant uh, potential in that also. Well, to that point, real quickly, we noticed something very strange in the MBA program at UVM, which is we were starting to attract people from all over the country, all over the world, and a strange thing began to happen, which was none of them want to leave Vermont. Now, the challenge is, is can Vermont absorb 40 to 45 MBAs every year, right? But, you know, part one of the challenge is kind of taken care of. They come here and they see what it's like to live here, work here, be in a creative community here, and they do want to stay. So some of those ingredients are already in place. It's up to us to kind of put all the other ingredients in place as well. And they're, they're social, they're economic, they're technological, they're public policy ingredients. So it's a, it's a complex system where a lot of things need to happen rather than, you know, look for one or two strings to pull. You know, when you think about the decision people make to stay in Vermont or to move to Vermont, and it's a, like Joe says, it's a complicated matrix. And in a way, it helps sort of zoom out and think about this Vermont proposition as a whole because we're talking about housing. Are they gonna find a place that they wanna live and can they find an affordable house? What about childcare? What about all of those other things, broadband like Carol talked about, all of those other things that contribute to people's decision about where they wanna live. And so it's, it's helpful to zoom, zoom out sometimes and think about that whole uh, sort of ecology that, that we, we grow here in Vermont to, to attract people and, and keep them here. Yeah, I mean, you, I think you both just said it. Vermont sells itself as soon as you're exposed to it, right? And so if we think about uh, how we attract those businesses and, and keep people here who want to live here, we have to tell the story of what's, what's possible. And I think that that's a part of it. You know, we need that public policy and we need all those things to change. We also, as John said, we just need to talk about it. And, and I'm excited to do it here and, you know, happy to do it anytime uh, to just showcase the great work Vermonters are already doing uh, to change our climate. We just have a couple of minutes left before we have to go, but I uh, just thought uh, maybe we could close uh, by batting this one around. Uh, you know, uh, we spent the last year wrestling with a pandemic. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, things happen that we never expected. And one of them, I, I guess, uh, well, it, was, it surprised me anyway, was all the folks who wound up moving here to uh, leave major urban areas that were perceived to be not as safe as a rural place like Vermont. We saw the explosion of remote working. Uh, as a result, we saw carbon emissions drop because people weren't driving as much. Um, do you think the net effect of the pandemic is gonna give us uh, an opportunity to kind of you know, jumpstart some of these changes? I mean, I think we discussed this point a little bit at sort of the beginning of our conversation, but uh, is there some sort of silver lining here that we might be able to tap into uh, to kind of speed this whole thing along? Oh, absolutely, there's a silver lining. I don't know if we can speed it along, but certainly Vermont has you know several built-in advantages, right? So it is a place where you ask somebody, if you could live anywhere and work anywhere, where would you want to do? Well, you'd want to do it in a place like Vermont. So there's that advantage. I also think that we're going to see culturally over the next decade or so is a real flight to safety. Right away from dense cities, away from dense populations, to places like Vermont where there's both physical safety, safety of your health, uh, safety of your property. And so, again, well positioned to do that. Um, it's also a place that's near a lot of higher education. 
So it's going to attract people who want those cultural amenities, but also those intellectual opportunities as well. So we have a lot of things in place now, almost like the mountains are in place to build the ski industry, almost like the lakes are in place to build the fishing and, and recreation industry. We have, uh, if we're smart about it, we'll understand how we should leverage that going forward. Yeah. And I think I agree. There's a silver, absolutely a silver lining to the, the tough challenge that was 2020. And, you know, I, I like to think that people, I certainly did. And, and hopefully my, I'm sure you all did too. You know, you kind of had to take stock and recalibrate a little bit. And I think that going through that process allows uh, people living here now or people that might move here now to kind of think about things a little differently. And that change that we talked about that's required to move to a new economy it's more possible now because look at what we've done. And so I, I hope that we can capitalize on that the fact that we've all been through this and maybe we are a little bit less afraid to change and, and thinking about what the future could look that's different. I, I tend to think that we're, you know, potentially less afraid of that now. John, you get the last word if you, if you'd like. Well, one way that I've come to think about this last year is that it reminded us all in a very sort of stark and abrupt way at times just how interdependent we are. And we're interdependent on our neighbors and our communities, but we're also interdependent in this global way. Like all of a sudden, we were all thinking about supply chains and where our food was coming from, where our toilet paper was coming from. And, and sort of it's like this curtain got lifted up for us all. And honestly, when we think about climate change, it is that interdependence that we all are sort of tackling together. We all hold our fate of each other in our hands. And in fact, for Vermont, there is this opportunity to do things a little more locally and to grow some of these new models where we are both interdependent, but also self-sufficient that I think is people are finding increasingly sort of appealing and attractive. That ability to control your own destiny in a place like Vermont, and it dovetails sort of with the climate economy, with the pandemic, and so many other things that I feel like are a little more prominent in people's minds these days. Well, uh, we're going to have to leave that there uh, for today. Uh, certainly fascinating subject, fascinating conversation. Uh, and clearly, um, Vermont will continue to have to advance creative economic solutions to climate change. I think we heard a few here in the last hour or so. Uh, well, I want to thank our distinguished panel uh, for being with us today. Uh, Joe Fusco from uh, Casella Way Systems, Carol Weston of Efficiency Vermont, and John Copans from the Vermont Council on Rural Development. Uh, I want to thank you all for making the time for, for this conversation today. And uh, well, uh, we'll be back next week with uh, Proposition 4. And uh, hope you'll tune in then to catch that one. Meanwhile, thank you all very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Andrew. Really appreciate it.